the um, title of the talk, Mineral Systems Perspective on Architecture Gold Deposits, Architecture, Fluids, Reservoirs, Transport, Depositional Processes. I've, I've added in uh, as a co-author Adam Bart, who's been working fairly closely with me over the last two years. Well, John Ronsky has given the credit for the question, why is the deposit there rather than somewhere else? Uh, I just want to hit on uh, this PowerPoint a couple of rocks to illustrate the problem. The top photograph is um, uh, Wattle Dam. And they're a high grade, well, they're not high grade, they're just gold band, basically, up to two or three centimetres wide and uh, maybe a metre or so long, as well as lots of clumps of native gold, sitting in an altered ultramafic, and the alteration assemblage is biotite and amphibol, pretty common garden variety assemblage. And the bottom photograph is a rock from um, some eyes that might be the same composition, same mineralogy. It's probably 200 metres from a high-grade gold resource and there's nothing in it. And just bearing in mind uh, what Cam was saying about the importance of scale, if, if you imagine you're an ant in that top picture, sitting uh, <coughs> five centimetres away from one of those gold veins, you would not know it was there. So that kind of encapsulates the problem we have about why is the deposit there rather than somewhere else. And there's some horrible truths about gold. It just doesn't care. It doesn't care about rocks, doesn't care about minerals, doesn't care about associated elements. So you can find uh, good gold in all, of it, all the rock types in um, the um, eastern Yilgarn gold types. And you can find gold associated with quartz, but no gold with no quartz. Same for carbonate, same for the feldspars, on it goes. There, there are no uh, simple answers about rock association, mineral association, or indeed element association. So that really brings you back to this mineral systems approach. The idea that if we look at the whole system and get a better understanding of the processes at work, we might get a few more clues about prediction. And I've used the, uh, the five question formulation here from the days of the PMD, CRC and the AGCRC, simply because they're um, five high level questions about the things we need to know. As Cam said, there are many different ways to describe your mineral systems. I like these questions simply because they are questions and they're not answers. So it sort of gives an element of objectivity to the whole exercise. As you work your way from architecture, these questions operate across scale. Again, that's an important point that Cam made, and you're going to focus on different questions in different ways as you cross scale. As you go down through that list, architecture, dynamics, reservoirs, fluids, pathways, drivers, getting into chemistry questions, it basically gets harder. So at the top, it's essentially geology, plus or minus some geochemistry, plus or minus some geophysics. At the bottom, it's pure chemistry. And uh, most of us actually avoided pure chemistry uh, in our academic and professional careers. Um, and for good reason. So there's a, there is a fundamental dilemma for all of us. Uh, we don't really like getting into the chemical, the hardcore chemical questions. So the default position for most of us, and I think as a community, again from the point that Cam was making, um, we default to our deposit models, whatever they are, origin, gold, poverty, coppers, VMS, etc., etc., etc. And we bury our chemical dilemmas in our water deposit models. I just hope that it's okay. All right, so I want to step back from all of that and uh, try and be a bit more scientific about this and get back to this ideal that actually we would get a robust layer of chemistry into our understanding, be real scientists, and then we would use that robust layer of understanding, chemistry, to say something about reservoirs, fluid pathways, drivers, and back integrate all of that into our space-time framework, uh, hopefully across scale. Now I'm going to talk about essentially the deposit to distribute scale. And uh, the reason for that is simply, well, the rubber hits the road at that scale, and uh, when you're asking companies for shekels, it helps to be a bit more focused on 
on the pan. And, and also because at that scale we have our best data sets. So if we're really going to get top, on top of the chemical issues, the best place to do it, the best scale to do it, is around water deposit scale a bit bigger, maybe an order of magnitude, say up to a kilometre or two. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, before I get there. Let me just, just throw in an equation. Um, I should have one equation. So this is, um, this is actually the, the, the general transport equation for the rate of mineralization. And I, I find that an absolutely fascinating equation. So the, uh, the left term there is the rate of mineralization. And uh, on the right side are the terms that influence the rate of mineralization. And the U there is simply fluid velocity. So that's pretty intuitive. That the rate at which we put the fluid into the system would have an impact on the rate at which we build the autobot. And then there are all these interesting cross terms in the, in the big brackets there. And those cross terms are made up of two terms. The first term is the way in which the metal changes its solubility in a fluid as a function of P or T or redox state or pH or sulfur activity or whatever. And the second term is actually a gradient term. So the way in which temperature might change with X, Y, and Z. Or the way in which redox would change with X, Y, and Z. Or pH for that matter. So in order to understand the chemistry and get it back integrated into our architecture and our dynamic history, etc., etc., there's really two, two problems we have to face up to. One is we have to understand what the important parameters are. And two, we have to understand how to map them. Go out there and map them in the field to uh, basically map the gradients. That's something we don't do um, at all well. Um, so let's just say that's a developing science form or art form. You go map our gradients. But, uh, I guess a message for me is that uh, we're going to do best at at least the, the uh, camp scale if we can map these gradients. Because they will give us the insight into the pathways and the, the critical places where the fluids are travelling, etc, etc, etc. And also hopefully some insight into where we should go to actually find the order problem. Alright, so I'm going to talk about gradient mapping. I'm going to talk about three parameters. So after a, uh, I don't know, a decade plus of thinking about all this stuff and actually going out the field and doing a lot of measuring, Come around to the view that uh, in addition to P and T, which we don't measure particularly well uh, at the count scale, there are three critical parameters. There's redox, there's pH, and there's water activity. It may turn out that in practice there are really only two critical parameters, that's redox and pH, and pH is actually related to water activity. So when you do your initial sort of thought sizes about the number of parameters you have to deal with. You get to a sort of maybe six or eight. But it looks like some of these parameters are co-correlated, so we don't have so many to actually to worry about when we get to the business of trying to map these gradients. So I'll talk about redox gradients quite a bit. And uh, I'm going to delve into isotopes, stable isotopes. Uh, and if you didn't like chemistry, you certainly won't like isotopes, but I'm going to take you there. Um, because it turns out they are the most effective way of precisely measuring the gradients. I'm persuaded about that. Um, and it's an R&D tool, measuring uh, isotope gradients. But there is new technology on the horizon that could make it an exploration tool. So this is not entirely academic. And it's the thing about measuring the isotope changes is it allow, allows us to bury down into the system and start actually saying something about the abundance of CO2 versus methane versus hydrogen versus H2S versus SO2. It's some kind of insight into the way these chemical species are actually varying in our systems. And I think that's really important. We've got to go and map that stuff. It was a lot more precision. And something like I'm persuaded that, that the species SO2 is actually carrying most of the sulfur in these gold systems. It actually gets into them as an oxidized sulfur species and then gets reduced by all the various chemical reactions that go on. So we're going to look at that at some ice camp. Another thing I'm going to look at at some ice camp is um, the 
the, what I'll call it, the, you know, what I call it here, the sort of the total pressure of CO2 and methane. What I'm really interested in is the total pressure of all the volatile species except, except water. Because it's kind of looking like when we're getting to high grade gold, we don't have a lot of water in the fluids. I have to defend that as I go through the talk. So I'm interested in measuring the total pressure of all those other species as opposed to water activity. I'm really trying to get at water activity, which is a, uh, the kind of concentration of water in your fluid. We all assume it's about, you know, kind of like it's dominantly water in the fluid, but it's not clear that it is. That's an important, uh, important learning. I'm going to talk about uh, alkalinity, mapping alkalinity, as I mentioned before. I think it may be related to water activity. So there are those three things I'm going to worry about, and I'm going to start with some ice camp, and I'm going to end up at the high grade bottle down deposit that is given, all, given um, well, everybody at shock, basically, including the research that we've done. So here are the learning boxes. It's an ice camp. And then uh, over to Waddle Down, which is 20 or 30 kilometres to the west of uh, the Sinai Camp. And I should say, uh, I, didn't, I should have mentioned that um, all this research has been done um, in the last decade and a half, probably, and it's pretty much wound up now. And, um, there are lots of players involved, and I, I, put, I acknowledge them on that first slide. So if I'm reminded, uh, given what Ross Large said, um, but I did leave um, someone off my initial PowerPoint. And that there is EIS money and the surveys labor is not there. So before Travis stands up at the end of my talk, I'll apologize now. <laughs> All right, so here's a view of the tonight's camp. This is a, a, a view from the geophysicist. The order was there shown in white. And uh, you can, uh, well, the red colors are basically the, um, so that the, the left image there is the gravity. So the red colors basically show the matrix sequences um, and the lighter colors showing the less dense rocks which are inferred to be these uh, intrusions, buried intrusions uh, along the coral. And uh, the other image is the seismic profile, uh, basically across Victory Defiance. And we're going to uh, go and have a look in detail at Victory Defiance, but uh, that seismic image is pretty uh, instructive. I lost I need, to, uh, I need to stand close to this. All right, so um, there's the size of the image, and there's that um, big intrusive-like thing that goes down about 6Ks, and um, above the top of that uh, looks like a whole series of intrusive complexes, and the ore deposit is sitting at the top of that. And, and that kind of architecture was highlighted by folks working in the PMDCRC, and it's pretty common right through the gold belt. And uh, you, can, you can tell whatever story you want to about that image. There's lots of scope. Um, this is what I want to get to. This is, uh, this is kind of the, the chemical architectural view, if you like, There's the way a chemist might see it, someone like Scott Halley. And um, what I've plotted up there at the camp scale is domains of dominantly oxidized alteration, they're the shown in the red. So the central corridor of the camp has a big, uh, is a big red zone. And, um, and then there's a blue zone, which is relatively more reduced. And this has been mapped uh, from a number of data sets, but most particularly uh, multi-element data sets, bottom hole stuff, and uh, elements like moly and bismuth would sit within the relatively oxidized domains, and um, an element like arsenic would sit in the relatively reduced domains. And there's some pretty strong changes that look like they're influenced by structure, and we'll come back to that. All right, so here's across the victory defiance. Um, or deposit. This section is a, is a little to the south, and it basically runs southwest, northeast. And um, the bottom panel there is a mineralogical view, and that top panel, um, well, but first of all, it's basically a, a pretty classic sequence through um, the Cambala uh, formation. So the bottom units are uh, the bottom green there is the linen, then into the ultramatrix and up into the Devon Consoles basalt. A bit of sediment there shown in light blue, the cap eye slate, and then um, uh, into the Pringer basalt. And over on the right hand side, the northeast, the black flag beds. So, and there's some structural complexity across the top of the anticline that you know, maybe John Miller will deal with, but I'm not going to. Um, that white, I'll just draw your attention to that white dotted line. 
Below that white dotted line, you'll find prim primary anhydride in the rocks. You'll find it in the porphyries, you'll find it in the DCB, you'll find it in the lunar. The kind of stuff that you find in a porphyry copper deposit in the Circum Pacific, um, it's in the core of this system. And uh, you've got to be down in the drilling maybe 300 metres plus before you see the primary anhydride. Above that, you see lots of gypsum, basically. It took us a long while to work out that the gypsum was actually kind of like the alteration cap on the top of this primary anhydride zone. And it, as far as I can tell, that zone goes right up the central corridor. So that's um, evidence that uh, sulphate is evidence for oxidation in these systems. And very broadly, uh, the sulphate's at the bottom of the system and you get more into sulphides as you go up through the system. So it's vertically zoned. The, uh, the bottom panel is a, is, a, is a hyperspectral view now. So someone like John Huntington might view life like this. Um, and it's, uh, it's a map of epidote clinozoazite composition. And the epidote is an Fe3 plus mineral and the clinozoazite is an al aluminium rich mineral. And it's, it's broadly a redox indicator. So you can see uh, the yellow, the, the orange colours there are the, where the epidote sits and it's in the core of the system, and the blue is where the um, clinozoazite sits, um, and it's, uh, it's sort of outboard and in the upper parts of the system. So that's, we interpret that broadly as a redox gradient as defined from hyperspectral mapping. And you'll notice where the ore deposits sit, um, they sit across these gradients. And it's not the first time that this has been picked up. Sometimes it's across white mica gradients. Um, here we've got it in terms of clinozoazite epidote. Um, so here's, now here's an isotopic view. So this is getting into heavy chemistry. So I've, I've given you various views of this world. So this is an isotopic view. Um, so going back to the big section, we have over a decade plus collected a lot of uh, isotopes across this section and elsewhere on the camp. And this is about trying to map in some detail of these gradients using what I think is the most effective tool, the effective R&D tool. So the bottom, the, the, the top image there is uh, sulfur isotopes. So that's, this is conventional isotopes. This is 34 to 32. The way this works, at the blue end of the scale, um, there's more 34, and at the red end of the scale, there's more 32. And um, I'll show you a faded diagram in a tick. But uh, the blue end is the more reduced end, and the, um, the red end is the, um, the more oxidized end. Um, and you can see that the, the color changes in that top um, picture uh, across the structure. Uh, the bottom picture is carbon isotopes and again a big colour change. Again the same kind of story, the blue is the reduced end, and this, this time I'm talking carbon 13 to carbon 12. The blue is the reduced end, the red's the more oxidised end. It's a different redox buffer, so it's in a different space. But you can see again very significant colour changes that relate back to the architecture. It's pretty clear that the faults and Mythology related to the faults are actually controlling um, these shifts uh, in, in uh, isotopes and in other minerals and in minerals and in some way partitioning the chemistry. It's really important. And the way you interpret these, just something about the, this, this little image isn't in the, um, uh, in the handouts that I threw a couple of extras in along the way. I'll try to remember to point them out. Um, here's the scale of the isotope ranges for you um, on a Pamel scale, both the sulphur in pyrite, so actually sulphur in pyrite and pyrite, and, um, and the carbon isotopes and the big ranges um, that, are, that, that by, any, by any measure these are big ranges. You, know, you go um, any mineral system anywhere on the globe and these stand up as big ranges. That's an important thing because it's telling us something about the, the, the variation in the chemistry in these systems. And the blue end again is reduced, um, and it's telling us about, ultimately it's telling us about the hydrogen flux in these systems, and the red end is the oxidized. And uh, the arrows there just point out what the, the dominant reservoir number is. So for C, CO2 or carbonate, it's somewhere around about minus five. Basically, if the number goes up the page, it goes positive, that's reduced. If it goes negative, you're oxidizing. It's getting more oxidized. You're oxidizing methane into CO2. <coughs> and the reservoir number for sulfur is somewhere around zero, probably slightly positive. And again, if it goes negative, it's oxidized. Um, 
blue is reduced. If I put that on a phase diagram now, given that uh, at least for half an hour we're going to be hardcore <coughs> chemists and think about phase diagrams, this is a um, redox pH diagram. And if any of you did uh, my um, economic geology course at the ANU many years ago, um, you would have had to construct one of these before you passed the course. Um, I think those days sadly are long gone. Um, anyway, um, it's a redox pH diagram, and I've, uh, the top of the page is oxidized. That's where the hematite, the magnetite is. You come down through the pyrite field and into the pyrotite field. And um, at the top, uh, you're looking around the sulfate H2S buffer, and that's where the sulfur isotopes change. So it's in that red, which is really oxidized, species like SO2 and sulfate are stable in the fluid. And that uh, cooler colors is where those species get reduced and convert to H2S. Down the bottom of the page is where the carbon isotopes shift. And that blue domain is a really interesting domain because it's saying that there's enough reductant in the system to start reducing carbonate or CO2. That's a very reduced world. And that's what I've called the hydrogen domain. And I'm really curious about those domains because they allow us to track the hydrogen flux in these systems. And I think that's a very important thing to be doing. And that middle ground there, the transitional... Uh, domain between really reduced and really oxidized. I call that the methane domain. It's a space where you start, you've got enough oxidants in the system to start oxidizing methane and reducing the sulfur. So it's kind of a transitional redox state. So if you put all that together, you can, start, you can start to map your way with the isotopes in quite a precise way from really oxidized to really reduced. Um, and you'll notice, uh, if I go back, I've got this, um, those, that redox range from the isotope sitting around a pH of 5 to 6, whereas I've got the gold depositional domain, although I haven't labelled it, because I'm talking about it in a little while, as sitting over on the right-hand side in a more alkaline domain. And the reason why I've got the pH around 5 to 6, which is like uh, at these PT conditions, which you can see there is 450 in a couple of kilobars, that's about neutral, slightly acid, slightly alkaline. The reason I'm there is because of this mineral clinozalzite uh, and its um, um, co-partner epidote. If you put the position of those um, minerals on that diagram, uh, then the clinozalzite epidote um, field is sitting around five to six. They're the minerals we see stable uh, outboard of the ore deposits in the main. Sometimes in the ore deposits, mostly you know, a kilometre uh, or less um, from the ore deposit, You've seen that style of alteration. It's an order, the, the clinozard is often missed in these systems. It's a sort of a, a, a creamy, honey-coloured mineral, commonly with, in quartz veins <coughs> uh, with some carbonate. Um, now, if you don't, actually, if it turns out you don't really want to bother with all that stuff that I've just given you, here's, here's the cheat sheet. Right, so if you uh, suddenly get an urge to um, go measure a few isotopes and some exploration ground you've got just to check where you might be, this is the cheat sheet. Um, so uh, on the vertical axis there is the carbon isotope uh, range. Uh, the horizontal axis, axis is the um, sulfur range, uh, actually is for pyrite and pyrotite. Um, and uh, basically you can read off where you are and the red domain is very oxidised. Um, that's where the SO2 sulfate species dominate, and it's the space where you'll be oxidizing methane. You go across the zero to the positive sulfur domain, and you've got that uh, methane domain where it's more reduced, but still there's enough oxidant around to be reducing, um, oh, sorry, to be oxidizing methane to CO2, and then you've got that top blue box, um, which is that interesting space I referred to, where um, the system is really quite reduced. All right, so coming back to the, uh, the isotope zoning across the Vicu Defiance, um, one of the messages, um, uh, well, reduced and oxidized species are interacting. That's a message from the isotopes. And that means that we're going to have to change some of our geological models. Um, but um, I think the isotopes are really compelling. And, and these reactions will go on in um, minutes to hours. The slowest ones might take a year or two. Um, so we are measuring in relative time scale uh, short time intervals. 
Now, I think that's important to realise, coming back to what Cam was saying about the timescales. These reactions are going on on really short timescales, geologically. Another important point is that the flat structures uh, are aquacludes. Traditionally, we've seen a lot of these major structures as being major conduits, bringing fluids from the mid-lower crust into the upper crust. It actually looks to me, at least where I've been able to map them, that uh, these are actually aquacludes. <coughs> So they're more like barriers in the system. Coming again back to what Cam was talking about, these, these barriers that kind of partition fluids and uh, store pressure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of these flat structures are, look to me like they're playing that kind of role. And it's the steeper structures <coughs> that look like they're carrying some of the fluids. Particularly, uh, the porphyry dikes look like they're conduits for oxidized fluids. I'm going to make that point in the next um, PowerPoint which is a little uh, blob of detail um, on the East Repulse deposit. So uh, you can see the big camp down the bottom left-hand corner, the big camp view, and coming into the Victory Defiance. And then this um, north-south, uh, south-to-north section. Again, it's all isotopes. Um, but it's looking through a 3D model in um, LeapFrog. So we put all this together in LeapFrog and overlaid it on the architecture. The architecture is given, well, the logical architecture is given in that bottom uh, little um, uh, diagram. And if you just cast your eye to the uh, sulfur isotopes, the top image, notice the red there. So there's, there's one drill hole out of a whole series that has a, a really strong oxidation signal. When you go down that drill hole, about the only difference you can see is that there's a bit more porphyry in that hole. But that looks like it is actually the major oxidised conduit in the system. And it's steeply dipping. Adam Bath's done some work that suggests that the alvatization has actually created secondary porosity in these dikes. So the timing of the fluid flow is kind of open to question. A lot of the alvatization is over fabric, so it's, I, I don't necessarily want to imply that this is an orthomagmatic fluid here straight off a porphyry dike. Um, but these uh, porphyry margins or porphyry dikes themselves look like they're conduits for at least the oxidised fluid, probably some cases the reduced fluids also. Going to that bottom image, uh, sorry, going to the middle image, the carbon isotope image, notice um, I've got the blue up the top which is the really reduced domain and then you come down through to that red domain that's sitting above the fault. In the bottom diagram I've just put a little um, loop in there, uh, zone of mixing above the seal. So that's a domain where you'd read off the isotopes that actually you were oxidizing it methane. It's like the seal broke. This is right, this is just sitting above the um, oxidized conduit, <coughs> above the ore deposit. But it looks like the seal broke and you had some mixing above the seal sometime during the ore forming process. The ore deposit is underneath the seal or the lid. But it looks like the lid broke a few times. So it's quite a dynamic process, again, uh, uh, going back to what Cam was talking about. All right, now I'm going to shift um, the time here. I'm going to shift um, a little bit and go down to a reduced part of the Samaj's field. Um, and uh, uh, the left-hand image there is the big uh, field view, then the image of the architecture around, uh, this is around the Athena hamlet deposits, shown in that little black box. And um, the ore deposits themselves are sitting on those blue structures, a couple of north-south uh, trending east dipping structures. And I've also put a bit of architecture in there, this is a lithological architecture here. And that bottom panel, again, a, a leapfrog model, um, shows you um, the variation in chemistry of the Peringa basalt. And the Peringa basalt is basically um, quite um, strongly zoned here, so you can work out, um, subdivide the lithology basically into lower, middle, and upper. And that gives you some idea of thickness variation in the Peringa basalt in that part of the world. The sequence is steeply dipping facing south, basically on the nose of the anticline. Um, and it looks to me like, um, from the thickness variations in the Peringa, that we are looking at another one of these. Um, old uh, kind of uh, basement uh, structures running more or less east-west um, and intersecting with north-south control. Maybe, uh, probably John will talk some more about this uh, in the field. But here's another one 
I think, has subsequently controlled other events in this part of the world. And you'll see why I'm interested in that in the next PowerPoint. So this is now just the carbon isotopes from um, this part of the world. You can see the blue. About the scale. The, scales are, the scale bar there is two kilometres. So there's a zone of blue that's hydrogen flux in the interpretation sitting between these two water posits. Big zone, um, uh, well as we've mapped it out, maybe a kilometre and a half wide, although it could be more extensive actually. That's just where we see it. And we didn't bottom out on this zone. As you go to the north, you start to pick up evidence for um, moving into the methane domain. In other words, you're getting more oxidised conditions and um, that little sort of, that, that kind of um, uh, gold, yellow um, feature that I've got running down from the um, top right to the bottom left there. That's, a, that's an inferred oxidised pathway running across this system and interacting with a reduced bit of the system. This is just quickly a downhole profile just to show you, and that's again not in your um, handout, just to show you um, uh, the marked changes downhole you get in the isotopes. They're very systematic. Um, on this panel, the left one is the gold grade, um, and you can see when you get into the gold world, the carbon isotopes, which is the next panel, change dramatically. They go from these uh, more or less positive numbers, which I'd say are in the reduced world, back to um, a CO2 rich world. Quite a significant shift. And the isotope, the sulfur isotopes also change quite dramatically. So over the ore zone you get these rather elevated numbers, which are a message about sulfate or SO2 reduction. So even though this is a very reduced system, um, pyrite pyridite stable, there's a message there that the sulfate got into the system and got it reduced. All right, let me give you another view of um, this is Athena now. This is just going to another world, worrying about another parameter. So uh, there's the, the top right hand is the block model of the Athena ore deposit um, looking north. Um, and you've got, actually got three structures highlighted there in, uh, this, is ti this is titanium mineral chemistry. This is not something you, you know, observe this with an SEM, Adam Barth has done this work. It's not something that you, you're not going to log this visually. But the outer zone is tight enough. It more or less corresponds with the big blue to reduce domain. Then as you come in board on these structures, um, you switch to ilmenite and ultimately to rutile. And uh, it's the, uh, it's not actually shown there on the, on the block diagram, but it's the right hand um, image, the, the right hand zone of ilmenite and rutile with the big red colour there. That's, that's actually the ore zone. A couple other structures in the foot wall that look interesting and some carry some grey. If, if you, going back to chemistry, if you invert the meaning of that onto a phase diagram, and that's the other image there, I've got redox against, uh, well it's total fugacity or total partial pressure if you like of CO2 and methane. Basically uh, the message is as you ramp up that gas pressure, you'll go from titanite to uh, ilmenite to rutile. So at the point of gold deposition, we're pretty persuaded we're dealing with high volatile pressures, CO2 and methane. And to calculate what the activity of water was in that solution, then I've estimated that, and they're not brilliant estimates, but I've estimated around about a half to 0.7, and could well have been lower. But we're looking at uh, fluids that look like they don't have a lot of water in them, maybe bugger all water actually, and um, other species. And that's quite important. And the other thing that, um, that is important here, um, which you can read from the isotopes, but I'm, I'm about to take you over to Waddle Dam and read this from the mineralogy. Um, that top left-hand diagram the bottom, uh, is uh, the same phase diagram, and there I've labelled the gold depositional environment as I read it from the isotopes. And, and bear in mind, these are pretty standard quartz veins um, with standard alteration assemblages. Um, and we're picking up these uh, big shifts around these veins. Okay. Uh, then I'll blame my time completely. Um, they, they turn out to be the important parameters um, uh, as I've read them from this mineralogy. So I'm going <coughs> to actually I'll go through, I will give, just show you something from Model Down. If, if at this scale, 
There's no visible alteration in selvage at that scale when you go and look at the rocks. If you go down to the micro scale, you find a hidden world of um, sodic alteration. Um, Agerine, sodic dendrites, um, sodium zirconium silicates. Uh, the world is 20 or 30 microns wide. So, so you have a vein that's that thick of gold, and the alteration of selvage is 20, 50 microns, which is absolutely arse about. It shouldn't be like that. Um, skip that, skip that, skip all the detail. Um, come to the phase diagram. One of the messages is that um, it's an alkaline fluid. I've just put all the minerals on a lot, another chemical diagram here. Um, and you can see uh, we're an alkaline well. Um, if these were carbonic fluids, the acid would, the, the pH would be around 4 to 6. We're much more alkaline than that. Um, and we're relatively reduced. Um, the only way I can do this is to actually have some non-polar fluids. So these are fluids that um, uh, um, methane, hydrogen, nitrogen, a few other components. We take the CO2 out because it will drive you acid and take a few other things out. And uh, because of that lack of alteration, I think there's very little water in these fluids. So we're looking at some kind of fluid that's, I think, pretty reduced. Uh, it's a non-polar fluid, and it's got to be crammed full of gold. How do you do that? We don't understand how the, this fluid carries the gold, but it has to be doing it. Um, so accounting for the chemistry, I'm going to say that there's um, we've got to think in terms of 3N member fluids. I think about a, a water-rich fluid. If you like, that's the standard origin of gold fluid, but I don't think it's doing the gold trick. Um, and then we've got to think about a couple of anhydrous fluids that are driving the chemistry. What I've called here the thermal drivers. How do these systems work? Well, they're big systems, and Cam's been making that point. They've probably got their roots in the mantle. Um, the chemistry, I think, is driven, a really important point to make here, the chemistry is driven by the volatiles. And, and a contrast in volatile chemistry is, a, is an intrinsic property. Not just about one kind of volatile, contrasting volatiles. And these productive systems are strongly zoned. So part of this critical self-organisation is to get these systems zoned. And if they're not, they don't work. Uh, does this work in exploration? Uh, can you take this and make practical use out of it? I've tried some targeting exercises, and I'm going to not go into the details, but basically the idea is find the oxidised bits, find the reduced bits, Compare the acid alkaline and put it on your architecture and draw your boxes. Pretty simple. Um, some of the challenges, um, we'll skip that. I think I'm out of time. Some references and um, folks want to ask questions, feel free. Are there any questions? Yes. actually on um, pyrite, pyrotite, carbonate. But you don't, need a, you don't need a pure separate, you just need a, a concentrated bit. And uh, that's a plug for, we just bought a book. This is very expensive R&D stuff, take a long time. Uh, we just bought a box, an infrared box, that I think will allow us to do carbon isotopes in carbonates. It may be something like, uh, 50 to 100 analyses a day. So you can actually go out there and map this stuff. That's, that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, sadly, well, we all know the state of the industry. That's probably why you're all here. Uh, and uh, I've got this box, but I have no shekels to run the box. So if you're interested, come to me. I've got a question for you, John. I've noticed an association of porphyry with the gold mineralization, particularly in the Murchison. And um, I always thought that it represented maybe a later infilling of some regional fertile um, mineral uh, faulting system rather than having a genetic component. But your slide on porphyry dikes uh, didn't indicate that. So do you think porphyries uh, have a genetic association with uh, gold? Well, I think so. 
But again, I think it goes, you've got to think across scale. And the dating work at the local scale says the mineralisation is later than the um, the, da the dating, you've got to think about this question across scale. So the dating work at the, at the local scale says the mineralisation is later than the immediate porphyries. And uh, there's textual evidence that would support all that. But maybe some of that big intrusive thing that we're looking at was still active. So, or maybe the fluids are related to the source of the porphyries, which is down in the mantle somewhere. So there is some genetic association, but it's what meaning you give to that, I think, depends on what scale you want to think about.